Genesis flood was an inspiration to creationists. In 1981, Louisiana Senator Bill Keith proposed a law requiring the teaching of creation science wherever evolution was taught. Scientific creationism is pure science and is just as unreligious as um, the teaching of evolution science. And also that, um, that it's, it's an abridgment of academic freedom for our school children not to be given all the scientific evidences regarding origins. Over opposition from educators, the Louisiana legislature passed the law. Creation science and evolution became classmates. But in 1987, the Supreme Court ruled that teaching creationism alongside evolution violated the First Amendment separation of church and state. In his opinion for the majority, however, Justice William Brennan wrote that alternatives to evolutionary theory can be taught if they have a scientific basis. What Justice Brennan wrote in the 1987 decision was that, of course, teachers have a right to teach any and all um, uh, scientific views about the origin of humans or any other scientific theory. And that's absolutely true. And what he said was any and all scientific views. Now, of course, one reason why the creationists have worked so hard to try to present their ideas as being scientific is so they can duck under the First Amendment. And I would just like to tell all of you how we want special creation to be taught. And like it's already been stated, we want it taught alongside evolution. I would just like to say that we do not want a religion class or any separate class because it is not religion. So we, we're just begging of you to teach us the facts and let us decide. And that is with evolution and special creation. There's a large part of me that felt, my gosh, we haven't done a very good job with the nature of science if we have this many students who don't understand the difference and why creation and, you know, any supreme being can't be addressed in a science classroom. And I kept thinking, gee, it seems like we try so hard to, to really hit home with what makes a particular event science. And the fact that there seems to be a lack of understanding about that was disturbing to me. What they don't understand is that science is a rather brutal competition of ideas. It is not particularly a, a situation where you get to express your idea just because you want to. That sense of fairness doesn't exist in science. In science, ideas are supported by evidence, and that evidence has to be peer-reviewed, and it has to be repeatable, and it has to be testable, and creationism is not that. And we know that it's our freedom to decide on the information. And we think that it's been neglected by the school system in the state and maybe even in the nation that there are facts we don't have. Thank you. It's real hard for me as a parent and as a teacher to know that not only are they dealing with their own faith issues at a very young age, 14, 15 years old, but they're also dealing with the issues of being disobedient to their parents. And I know that for many of them, it's not only, oh, the evils of evolution, it's that my parents don't even want me to hear about this or listen to it, much less participate in the conversation. I grew up in the church. God created all things. That's the way it was. That's how it ever will be. And I didn't get my first even notion of evolution until like third grade when we were learning about insects. And they're like, well, one day you'll learn that the building blocks of life actually evolved from water. <laughs> and so I went home to my mom and dad, and I was like, we came from water? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's called evolution, and I still didn't understand it. And I guess I had read about it or something, but I just knew that God created us in six days, and I knew he was the creator. And my mom agreed with me on that. My stepdad doesn't, but I don't really know how I learned that. It's just, I probably read it in the Bible. Don't move this. OK, come on over here. Look. And I had the same conflicts these kids are having. I mean, I went through that whole growing process myself. And so I can really sympathize. And fortunately, I had a lot of significant people in my life that were willing to sit down and listen to me. I had a very, very intelligent pastor tell me once that I asked him what he thought. And he said, what I think doesn't matter. It's what you think. And he said, here's what I recommend. You learn a lot about both. 
and then you make your own decision. And that's what I did. I went to Bible studies um, and I pursued careers in science and just fell in love with them. And I would say that probably by the end of my senior, or maybe I was even in college before I really came to terms with the fact that in my mind and in my heart, there was no conflict. They answer very different questions. They address very different things in our lives. And, and I think they're very, as an individual, for me, they're very supportive of one another. I can't really see that one could exist without the other, at least in my mind. Other comments from the board? Just For over three hours, the students, their supporters, and their detractors struggled over the proposed change in the science curriculum. Finally, the board made its position known. There is well-defined legal and scientific definitions that set out the boundaries for biological science. There are certainly points to be dis to discussed about special creationism, but it does not belong in the, in the biological curriculum. We've made it very clear that we are not going to change the biological science curriculum, that if we want to address their intellectual curiosity, it has to be under the umbrella of a humanities topic in some fashion. I want to say thank you so much for coming. I hope you all understand that when we make a decision about our position, we do it because we believe it's our duty. We believe that the law requires us to do what we do and that we, in our meager understanding of science, are trying to do what we think is right. If you have any other questions... The decision preserved the integrity of Jefferson High's science curriculum. But the teachers know this is not the end of the debate. I have yet to hear of a case where they've given equal time in a science classroom. However, I have heard of cases where they've removed evolution from the curriculum. And I don't think the three of us would have continued teaching here had that been the case. I can't speak for them, but I really don't think as an educator I could teach biology and do it well if I couldn't talk about the natural processes that make it work. To take that element out would be removing one of the, well, the major pillar that supports that whole field of science. And in good conscience, I couldn't have slighted my kids that way in my classroom. The gift to be sins, the gift to be free. The gift to be free, the gift to be free. The gift to be free. Are we placing students' faith at risk by examining these hard questions? Absolutely. But I would add additionally that there is no such thing as a safe place from which to hide from these issues. If we engage in the most rigid biblical literalism, the fact that our students live in a real world indicates that their faith is always at risk. Christians believe that our faith is rooted in real happenings in a real world. And so to try and structure a place or a way of conceptualizing our faith that insulates us and isolates us from risk is to rob Christianity of its very essence. One problem we have a lot of times is that people just look at Christians and they say, oh, you're just one of those religious fanatics. I don't want to come across as that. I want to be educated, I want to be intelligent, I want to have answers that someone can say, I can respect that, I can respect that. And also be able to argue some answers without God. I mean, that sounds almost sacrilegious, but I, I want to be able to reason some things without having to bring, ne without necessarily having to bring God into the picture. And then I want my life and the way that I live it to reflect God. I don't think science and faith are inevitably in conflict. I am a scientist, I enjoy doing science, and I haven't thrown God out the window at all. I mean, I know a lot of people who live the same way. And because we look for natural causes and things doesn't mean we think that that's all there is. It doesn't mean that we're throwing out the meaning of life. We're just studying what God has made, however he made it. And I don't think those are in conflict at all. When I hear a God-fearing man say, I hold to the evolutionary theory. That was, that was, that was, that worked wonders for me. It, 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 once again, it gave me a little bit of a freedom to say, wow, God is bigger than the box that I may put him in. As his grandmother predicted, Nathan is searching it out. 
he is finding his own answer to the question, what about God? Charles Darwin's answer came in the mystery of evolution itself. In the final edition of his book, On the Origin of Species, Darwin wrote, there is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed by a creator into a few forms or into one. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful have been and are being evolved. Continue the journey into where we're from and where we're going at the Evolution website. Visit www.pbs.org. The seven-part Evolution box set and the companion book are available from WGBH Boston Video. To place an order, please call 1-800-255-9424.